ven la, la charla de hoy y la que está por hacer ahora es, bueno, eh, empaquetar los datos como si fueran software para ver qué cosas pueden surgir de ahí, hacer fácil el acceso a los datos. Pero por otro lado, también hay un workshop que va a estar haciendo que se llama California Code Rush, que ellos están haciendo un eh, California Civic Data Coalition, es un proyecto nuevo, donde tratan de hacer más fácil el acceso a ciertos datasets que publica el estado de California. Al principio, cuando yo leía, cuando yo leía de, de qué se trataba el workshop, dije, bueno, es raro, como, bueno, datos abiertos de California. O sea, ¿qué tiene, por un lado pensaba, bueno, ¿qué tiene que ver con nosotros y por qué alguien iría a ese workshop? Pero después empecé a entender que, bueno, cuando lo estoqueé un poco a Ben y entendí quién era y, y que era una persona interesante, me parece que eh, el workshop va a estar muy bien porque él, para empezar, piensa, piensa estos datos y piensa el proyecto muy como software libre. O sea, hay toda una parte de, bueno, entender cómo funciona un proyecto de software libre. Pero al mismo tiempo me parece que hay muchas ideas de este proyecto que, eh, bueno, está empezando, pero realmente está, está empujado por gente con mucha polenta. Me parece que va a ser muy interesante entender qué podemos ver de eso y realmente, yo no fui. Eh, entender, eh, involucrarse en el workshop, entender qué es lo que están haciendo ellos para ver qué es lo que nosotros podemos traer para acá. Me parece que está bueno jugar a ir, meterse y meterse, bueno, con los datos de California. Es un, él trae muchos tickets para resolver. Eh, hay cosas grandes, hay pedazos de código, hay documentación. Me parece que está bueno, eh, están las dos cosas, esta charla y el workshop muy relacionados. Me parece que después de ver la charla les va a interesar eh, ir al workshop. If I just take this out, walk around like this. Hello, how is everybody? Hi, my name's Ben. That's me. I'm working on my Argentine beard. You know, it can't be too thick, right? It's just got to be a little scratchy. That's how I fit in here. Kind of work on that. Uh, I sometimes go by Pale Wire online, and I'm here visiting you from Los Angeles, California, where I work at the Los Angeles Times, which is a daily newspaper and 24-hour website, and I work on a team there called the Data Desk. And we're a group of nerds that try to take data and turn it into news, where what some people now call data journalists, other people used to call computer-assisted reporters, some people might call hacks and or hackers. We are it, we are you, we are the people trying to do this stuff in a real American newsroom. And I'm going to talk to you today about how we do things currently and how I think we as a group can maybe do things better. And uh, the criticism that I've made put out is really self-criticism as much as that of anyone else, all right? But before I begin, I want to start with an apology. I'm sorry, my Spanish is so bad, I don't dare speak it in front of you. All right, I'm married to a Spanish speaker. She tries to encourage me to use it all the time, but really I'm about good at this as this guy. And so I'm just going to avoid it. And I'm sorry, right? Now, I do live in Los Angeles where many people speak Spanish, and most of it that I've picked up, I got uh, eating lunch, right, at places like Pinche's Tacos or No Jodas Cuban Kitchen. But my wife has assured me that these terms are not fit for such an august audience as yourself, so I'm just going to avoid it. All right, anyway, uh, so if I'm talking too fast or I, I move too quickly and there's things you want to catch up with, you can find all the slides and the links for the things I talk about at this URL. And you can just uh, hit that in. So, you know, this is HTTP, bit.ly, blah, blah, blah. Got it? We ready? Okay, let's go. I don't got much time. All right, one. Okay, so how do we do data journalism today? In my opinion, not really well, right? So where does it begin? It begins oftentimes with the government, right? They have some valuable data about something that they're up to that we want to get at, understand, write about, and probably say something nasty about so that they fix it, right? So we go to them and we say, at least in America, we can say, I can write a letter. And I can say, dear government, please send me every piece of data that you have on this topic. And this is a real letter I wrote. And I send it off in the mail or attached to an email, which is really kind of a weird thing, a letter attached to an email. Why do we do that? But we do because I don't know. And then am I, I'm supposed to get the data, but I don't. A long period of time goes by. I have 10 or 20 other emails. These are real ones. There's an extended negotiation. We, they, what are we really going to get? Am I going to have to pay for it? How's it going to happen? What's going to da 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 right? Then ultimately, wow, one day a CD arrives at my desk or in the mail, and inside of it is a crazy government database with no documentation and dozens of tables and so much data that I can barely understand it. And then I then spend days or weeks puzzling and trying to figure out what is in this database and how does it work and can I find anything or understand it or what's going on. 
And in that process, I might meet someone like this, the government employee responsible for creating that database who no one has ever asked how it works, and he's so excited to tell me. And we have long conversations, and I get to learn a little more about it. And I write really bad computer code. This is, real, this is by me that just like tries to pull out that data and move it around and try to find what's going on in it. And I'm still lost, and more days and weeks go by, and I don't know what's happening. And then my editor, very polite, or then I'm totally confused and just lost, and my editor calls me into her office, and she's like, well, you know, why do you work here again? And what's really happening? And shouldn't you be producing something that we can actually publish at some point? At which point I then freak out. I get out my machete and I start hacking at the data and like trying to find something out of it. And I, in that process, I like create something like maybe a graphic and some stories and this thing we're going to say. And then, whoo, I get across the finish line and we finish it and it's done. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, we finally got there. And I never want to ever think about or talk about the state again. And all that computer code. And all that work and everything that I learned in that whole process, where does it go? Right there, right? And I go back to the beginning and I find a new topic and a new government person to pick on and a whole new process to begin again. And all that stuff that I learned that was really, really valuable, most of it ultimately gets lost. And this is really dumb, right? And I do this, and many of my colleagues do this, and I think people in this room do this, and it's kind of part of our like, uh, news culture that in, when, when it works fine when you're just doing a story in one day, and you can throw it away and start again the next, but when you're doing really complex data work on databases that we revisit again and again, and that everyone uses, and we're writing software, it, st it starts to stop making sense. And so, you know, I think we need to, as a group, start being a little bit less like hacks and a little bit more like hackers, right? If we're going to be writing software. And, you know, it's, it, there is some good news. People are getting a lot better at it. Largely, I think, thanks to a really great website and technology called Git and GitHub. Who here is using Git and version control when they write their code? A lot of people, that's good. It should be everybody, right? It should be unacceptable to work on our field without doing it, and more and more people are. And like, that means as you're doing that story and writing that code, every little change you write gets saved so that you can walk back and understand everything you did and it all gets recorded permanently and it never gets lost in, in 500 straight SQL queries or six Python scripts that got ran in who knows what order at what time and have totally strange names and are tucked into some bizarre folder with weird names that have like dates in the file names and all that crap, right? This really helps you get past that. A lot of people are then also using it to publish the data that they use as their analysis online, which is really great. And then even some people who are total overachievers are then taking the code that helped create their analysis and they're putting it on GitHub so people can kind of walk back and see what they're up to. And this is great for accuracy. It helps us not make mistakes by being more careful about the code that we write. It's great for transparency because it helps us um, be held accountable and for our readers to see what we're doing and build our credibility and maybe avoid some mistakes that way and know that we're being watched, which is also good. And it's great for reproducibility as well in a scientific sense that someone could take our methodology and our systems and be able to recreate we're doing no good. And people are doing this now and more and more are doing it and that's a good thing and we should be pretty happy with ourselves, right? This is like something that the science journals and people in other fields feel like they're behind and journalism's doing good. But there's like one problem. If you go to any of these repositories, uh, you know, not to pick on anyone in particular, but I looked at a whole bunch of them preparing for this talk where people in our field are posting their code and saying, oh, I'm so open and this is the open source and let's build the community. What do you see at each one of those when you check them out? You see this, right? And if you're not a GitHub user, it might not make sense, but the website with your code has some very simple metrics. How many people have contributed to this code? How many people are interested in it? How many have made their own copy and have worked on it? And what I think we find with almost all the open source that our, our news people are putting out related to stories is you're seeing very, very little contributions, right? Or community building around these topics. And there's some reasons for that, right? Which I think we should, we should think about and understand because there's no, what is the difference between the ghost town that we put online and the trash can that we had before? Really not much. You get some of those scientific benefits of transparency and accuracy and reproducibility, but you don't get any kind of benefits of the code contributions and the community building of a true open source project, right? And so you end up being Atlas working alone just like you were before.
So how do we get better? We get even nerdier, I think. So let's like let's look at let's just look at a basic open source project and see how it works. Okay? So let's learn from the nerds. So if I go to GitHub and I look at a thing called requests, has anyone used requests? This is a Python library, right? And it does, what does it do? So first off, I can go to my terminal, you could do this right now, and I can use a tool called pip, which installs package software, right? So this is a tool on almost all, you know, uh, you know, computers, or can be installed on most computers, which will go into the cloud and will install software that's pre-packaged for you to use with one line, so it's very easy to get, right? I don't have to go and read your Python notebook or find some weird thing or whatever. It's there in a centralized repository, and with one command, I can install this piece of software. Then I can jump down into my Python terminal, and I can now import it and use it. I'm now writing Python. I can, I can then tell it to, to, to go get a, a URL and return it. And that's all this library really does, is you say, hey, here's a URL, something on the internet, I want you to go get it. It can do more than this, but this is the basics. And then it returns a response. And that's really all this thing does. That's not as exciting as an investigative story or something more complex, but guess what? It's what people want, and it's what people will collaborate on. Look at this, 38 million downloads of this one simple library, right? And why is that? Because it does one thing and does it well. One of my favorite nerd acronyms, ready? does one thing and does it well, which is also known as the Unix, Unix philosophy. And it's really a Lego, right? It's a component of a work when strung together with 10 other open source libraries or other things that another developer, not you, part of your story, but maybe future you, right, can use to build something that they want to do. And the code that we're putting out oftentimes related to our stories and work is more like this. The cathedral here in Buenos Aires, right? So instead of being a Lego, it's a cathedral, right? And what do you do at cathedrals? You go to worship and that's about it, right? You don't go there to get work done, all right, or build anything. So if we're gonna try to do that kind of thing in our field, what are our Legos, right? What are the components of data journalism and the work that we do that might be possible for us to collaborate on? And I think there's probably a lot of answers to this question, but one that I think is potentially interesting is data sources, right? So there are out there in our world of journalism certain data sources that we return to again and again and become almost like beats or topics that we're covering, right? What's happening in the data? And that can be election results, public opinion polls, sorry for the clip art guys, uh, crime reports, you know, what's happening on Wall Street, the census, school starts, but you know, here in Argentina, the blue dollar, which is one of my favorite phrases I've learned, right? There's actually a Twitter account, right, that just tweets the blue dollar at me every day, which I started following, which is very cool. Um, and each of these are data sources that are consistently updating, have some schedule, are structured, are gigantic, and that reporters in different ways to pursue different ends, to tell different stories, are all mining all the time every day, right? And for every one of those data sources, almost all the reporters have their own little script to do basically this go to the government, get the data, convert it, you know, pull it down and save it and do something with it, load it into a database and repeat, right? And this process is known in, in computer software as ETL, right? Because they can make anything boring in IT. ETL stands for extract, transform, and load. And it's a basic component of almost all data journalism that, all, that many, many news outlets are writing for all these same sources. And everybody's creating their own different competing pipelines to go get that data. There's the Washington Post. There's the New York Times. There's La Nacion, whatever you can, you know, let's, let's twist this metaphor as far as we can. When instead... I think it's possible for us as a community to get together and build big pipelines that are bigger, better, stronger, right? And then we all collaborate on so that we don't independently all spend all this time doing the exact same thing, doing the boring part of our work. Why should we compete at downloading and unzipping database tables, right? We should be competing at finding and telling stories and doing ambitious analysis and making a difference. So this sort of boring component of our work might be the kind of thing we can organize around, I think. So instead of, say, pip install requests, 
why can't I do pip install BA election results or pip install blue dollar and very quickly have basic data sources and those basic scripts available to me as packaged software in the same way I have all these other components and then those can be well documented, maintained and, and, and you know grow and get better with time. Right? There are existing projects that do this and I think they're all awesome and going in the right direction and we should do more like them. Uh, open states, Treasury IO, open elections, uh, the data, uh, Open Knowledge Foundation are all kind of moving in this direction. And it's also the inspiration for a project that I'm here to talk about at this conference, which is called the California Civic Data Coalition. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a team of uh, the LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, Stanford, and Center for Investigative Reporting, and we're coming together around uh, campaign finance data. The state of California released the bulk database of all the money in, in California state politics. It's 76 tables, 650 megabytes, 35 million records, and about, about zero, uh, you know, clues on how to use it. And no one does really good California campaign finance analysis because it's too hard to unpack and work with this database. So why should we all slave separately and fail to work on it when we can come together and write code that, that will make it easy for everyone to do it and broaden the pool that can happen? And so that's what our project's about. You can see it on GitHub. And if you just Google California Civic Data Coalition, and I'm here at this conference to promote the project and to try to get people involved. We have an event we call the California Code Rush. I'm here with hundreds of tickets related to this repository that can make, help make us improvements and push towards our uh, push towards our next milestones. I have prizes, stickers, and T-shirts for people who get things done. And there's ways anyone can get involved. If you're a hacker looking on Saturday for something of medium size to work on, come talk to me, we can find something cool. If you're someone who's never made a contribution to an open source project or used GitHub before, we have lots of little itty bitty ones that'll take you 10 or 15 minutes, I'll walk you through it, you'll learn how all this process works and, and get your feet wet in, in real open source project. Okay, so you can find me later today at the media fair, the workshops, in the hallways, anytime, and all day at the hackathon. All right, and that's basically it. Uh, you can find, again, more the, everything from this presentation here at Package Data, the more about the code rush here, and, you know, feel free to email me or bug me at any time about anything, and that's it, guys.